we'll move on. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Testing. Okay, we're good. Um, I kind of wondered about that. Thank you. Uh, delegations and presentations. Um, Eileen Bell, come on up. We're going to hear some poetry today. Great way to start every presentation. And we'll just uh, make sure the mic and everything is working there so that everybody online can hear. Test, test. And whenever you're ready, let it. Okay. So the first poem I'm going to read is I grew up on a farm near Kamloops. So it was supposed to be a haiku, but the haiku got lost. So. <laughs> Riverland. Restless river winds, winnowing valley farmland. In father's garden, hens squawk, silver sunlight dances. Hens prance, single file, foul feet indent narrow path. Spurn garden's bounty for girl in dusty pants, rattling evening's grain bowl, wind rustles treetops. So the second poem is, they're all quite short. The second poem is uh, a children's poem, and it rhymes. It was inspired by a time on the Molliet Ranch when I was a child, being read to in a cabin by a, a nice old lady. I am a rocking chair made from human flesh and hair. I have a smile and hands to hold a book of stories yet untold, of dogs that know of human speech, of dusty rooms where old men sleep, where children dance past time and space, and rainbows color sunshine's face. Clocks to track your heart's soft rhyme, not of use for story time, grow wings and flutter over sill, then return to doorway still, and listen with enchanted pale, as wings brush breath of summer's tail, soft as waiting breeze exhales, such wonder as my tail enthrall, enthralls, past tick of time to bend and fall, to rock the world of greed and rush, to gentle sway of stories hush. And this, the name of the poem is Haiku, but it's just a poem talking about what haiku is. <laughs> haiku is as poetry, a feeling unnamed, a world minus I or we. A breathless undercurrent creeps as a root through a cracked cellar wall. Stealth wind whispers inside a warm afternoon rain. Thank you. That was awesome. Definitely see the images and all that. Do you need your books back? Okay, we'll pass those um, over and, uh, yeah. Unless somebody wants to buy one. Okay, you, you caught me without my wallet, but yeah, I mean, that's good. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, yes, I keep, keep bringing poets here, please. I love this idea, so thank you. Um, so we have an uh, up next, we have an interesting presentation from Dr. Catherine uh, Tarasoff, who's online about the flag iris uh, that we have in Dutch Lake and other places. So uh, whenever you're ready, Dr. Tarasoff, come on down and well, come on down on screen and and um, tell us what we need Thank to know. You Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you for coming today. Bye bye. I was interested in the next part, but apparently we're leaving. OK, so I should be unmuted. Um, I'm just looking for my the share screen. Okay, we'll oh. just make sure that happens, and yes, we can hear you. It'll take a second. There we go. <clears throat> oh. There we go. We, now we can see your presentation. Okay. 
Well, um, I just want to start by thanking the council for inviting me to come today and talk about yellow flag iris. We have been sort of working together now since 2014, and this is a good opportunity, I think, to talk about um, some of the lessons and opportunities um, that I've experienced over these almost 10 years now. So. Um, I'll just give a little background first on yellow flag iris. So if there's people that aren't aware of this plant, it's a long lived perennial. It has a massive food storage. Um, people think it's a root, but it's actually called a rhizome and it's underground and it can tolerate full sun. It can tolerate actually quite heavy shade. It can grow in 100% fresh water like Dutch Lake but it can also grow in 100% salt water. So it's been found on the Gulf Islands growing on the beaches. It can grow in one meter deep water right up to under the canopy of trees upland. It can tolerate very long extended drought periods up to three months with no water. So it has this incredible range of ecological conditions that it can grow in, which leads to it being what's called a um, cosmopolitan weed. So it's found all over the world, every single continent. Um, and what we see at Dutch Lake is not unusual in that it's very aggressive and it pushes out native plants. Its main mode of dispersal is seeds by seed, <clears throat> although these, um, these are called rhizomes. The rhizome fragments can break off. And you can see that picture is from Dutch Lake. It's taken on the dock. And that is a fully formed yellow flag iris plant that is just floating around. I just scooped it up out of the water. Fully formed leaves and roots, just waiting for um, a site to um, establish. Seeds can float for up to a year. And what it does to the ecosystem, which you probably noticed, at Dutch Lake is it buries the shoreline under a deep organic mat. It collects sediment, it creates its own kind of detritus mat and, um, and it buries the rock, rocky shoreline. And not, you know, not only does it bury the rocky shoreline, but of course it pushes out any native plants that would have been growing on that rocky shoreline. And how this impacts our enti the entire ecosystem is that when the rocky shoreline is buried, then the aquatic macroinvertebrates, so the aquatic bugs that would be living in that rock as, that, as their habitat are now pushed into deeper waters. Um, the birds that would feed on the bugs or the birds that would eat the sedges and rush seeds um, lose their food source because yellow flag iris uh, is toxic to animals. And so the plant quite literally pulls the carpet out from the ecosystem right from the ground up. It, um, it removes those aquatic macroinvertebrates and the plants that those two together provide the foundation for the sort of the ecosystem um, health and the food chain in the lake. So here's a little history of the work that's happened at Dutch Lake. Um, in 2014, I started researching uh, using benthic barriers, which is really just um, rubber mats as a mode or a method to control yellow flag iris. And I'll show some pictures later. And um, we had two research sites, Dutch Lake and Vaso Lake. So Dutch Lake has really been the, the foundational site for so much of the work that's happened in BC. And um, so the, those results were great. They were published, the benthic barriers worked. You can see here how the yellow flag iris is moving from the shoreline where I'm standing out into the deeper water. In um, shallower systems, it will completely clog up uh, a whole lake or a whole wetland or a whole, you know, slow moving stream. So Dutch Lake is big enough that it can't ever be filled in. 
In 2016 and 17, we tried some restoration planting and uh, it worked and plants took. Um, we found that actually was not difficult to plant into previously occupied yellow flag iris sites. We also did mapping with um, using a drone, which I'll show the mapping image from, and we created an educational brochure. So I have to say that the District of Clearwater has been very supportive of work at Dutch Lake and not just um, the council, but also the community members. So um, when I'm out there working with a crew, I get a lot of high fives and a lot of people are very supportive of the work that's happening. And none of my sites have ever been vandalized or destroyed in any way. So I think that um, we have a good history of work at Yellow, on Yellow Flag Iris at Dutch Lake. So then in 2018 until now, we, um, I've been able to secure some um, first federal, then provincial funding to just do some ongoing treatments, yellow flag iris control around the lake. So here's the brochure that was made. It's, it's um, printed on two sides and it's a four fold brochure. So that's available um, as an educational resource. <clears throat> and here's the map that was produced in 2017. And um, it's color coded blue and red, whether it was, um, you know, whether it's crown land or private land, although those, those sort of um, don't really mean a lot because of course the surveying is outdated and um, the whole shoreline has likely shifted. But uh, regardless, you can see from this map that almost the entire perimeter of the lake um, is infested with yellow flag iris, including, of course, the island that sits out in the lake. Um, there is about 16,000 square meters of yellow flag iris around the perimeter. That was, of course, in 2017. We expect that it has expanded since then. Um, so I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It's a challenging um, site. It is definitely in my top sort of three um, worst yellow flag iris sites that I've been to. Um, of course, I haven't been everywhere, but um, there's a number of challenges to Dutch Lake. Um, but there's also opportunities. So from 2017, uh, I gave a presentation to council and these are the recommendations that were made in 2017. Uh, this picture here is um, just between the public beach and Jasper Way Inn. And it's a fairly common uh, photo of how yellow flag iris looks around Dutch Lake, um, except <clears throat> that the trees aren't coming right down to the shoreline. Um, so this is, was actually a fairly straightforward site to treat. So in 2017, I recommended that we install educational signage, which we did. Um, I recommended to contact private landowners and um, get some kind of engagement going with um, landowners that reside on the shores of, Yellow Fly, of um, Dutch Lake. I, I don't think that that's happened. I suggested to reserve, um, to purchase a reserve of pond liner. That's what was being used for the barrier. And we now have a pretty good supply of, um, of the barrier or it's sort of a modified pond liner. So we have a pretty good supply of that for Dutch Lake. Of course, we could always use more, but um, I feel like that's been addressed. At the time, I suggested that we utilize stockpiled conveyor belting because that's what I had originally used. But now, of course, I have a better product that's much easier. So I would never recommend that now. I also said to apply for provincial and federal funding to begin large scale treatment. Um, we didn't pursue that, um, but those funding sources are always you know, ongoing. Hire summer students and engage volunteers. Uh, we've been able to do that a little bit, and I'll talk about that next, and then continue monitoring and treatment, and that, um, 
I monitor the areas that have been treated and we're continuing treatment, but we haven't conducted any new mapping um, assessment of the lake. So that brings us to 2018 till now. So I've been able to leverage um, federal and provincial funding with some District of Clearwater seed funding to kind of access um, a workforce through the Invasive Species Council of BC. And so we use that funding, uh, it comes from Habitat Conservation Trust Foundation currently, and the work crews come out for two to three days a year, and um, they get trained and supervised and um, Sometimes, you know, they can range from anywhere to three to six people. The area that we treat each year is fairly small. So you can see they're working on a patch there. They probably treated three times that area. And we've been focusing on District of Clearwater owned land next to the public beach. <clears throat> so the challenges that I've experienced over the years um, that really some of this is unique to Dutch Lake and some of it's not. So installing the benthic barriers is labor intensive. It is a whole lot easier than hand digging. Hand digging is not recommended. So while it's more labor intensive than, you know, mowing your lawn, it's uh, definitely not as labor intensive as hand removal. Dutch Lake is a, has a very large area to treat and there's nothing we can do about that. It's just the way it is. And the terrain is difficult. So around the lake, there's vegetation that comes right down to the shoreline. There's steep terrain. There's difficult to access areas. So um, it can be slow just to get to the yellow flag iris sites. Um, we have had homeowner conflict, so the homeowner engagement piece is important. Um, the permitting is not onerous, but it does need to be done, so provincial and possibly federal permitting. The stewardship funding that I've been accessing, this is the last year of a five-year grant or four-year grant, so I don't know where that stands moving forward. if. I'll get more stewardship funding or not. And the last one that is unique to um, Dutch Lake is that it's sort of a bath. Circulate around and around and around this big bathtub and they float for a year. So even though we're treating yellow flag iris, the seed pressure is very high in the lake for um, for it to reestablish. Um, so that becomes challenging just because there's so much seed pressure in the lake. Now there's opportunities that um, I think are worth sort of presenting. One is that um, since the original work was done at Dutch Lake with uh, the benthic barriers, um, I'm subsequently I researched this method called deep water cutting and these photos are from GM wetlands which probably rivals Dutch Lake as my hardest site to treat um, and so at GM wetlands we tried deep water cutting and you can see so this photo is taken at two different angles but um, you can see the big culvert with the happy face on it and in the first photo the yellow flag iris is to the right of that and then in the second photo, a year later, the, um, there's no regrowth of the iris. So around this lake, we treated uh, 42 yellow flag iris populations with deep water cutting only. And 75% um, of those sites had no regrowth a year later. Um, the key is that the area has to have at least 10 centimeters of water year round. It takes a year of being completely underwater. And if there is um, yellow flag iris on the shoreline, then the iris on the shoreline needs to be treated with a barrier so that, with a rubber barrier so that it can't kind of provide food and oxygen to the water, the population that's in the water. So this is a much faster treatment option. 
and it um, doesn't require installing the barrier unless you have the connection to the shoreline. The other opportunity for Dutch Lake is in fact that there is no inflow or outflow and it's just a bathtub. That on the grand scheme is great because it means the yellow flag iris isn't traveling or is less likely to travel out of Dutch Lake and down through the water systems um, of Clearwater Valley. So while it's, while it's sort of confounding in that it makes it harder in the lake, the benefit is that it's not able to spread. Other opportunities are homeowner engagement. I think that the experience I've had over the last few years of how supportive people are in general um, leads me to believe that homeowners, not just homeowners on the lakeshore, but the general community um, could be engaged to come out and help with maybe not installing the benthic barriers, but possibly deadheading and just reducing that seed um, pressure on the lake. So I think there's some opportunities to get the public involved and maybe schools. Um, and then also lastly is district led grant applications. So the funding that I've been apply able to apply for is all quite small and uh, stewardship funding, whereas I know that districts have access to other funding opportunities. And so possibly getting into other funding pools may lead to larger grants that could then translate into bigger treatment areas um, down the road. So I'll leave it there and I'll take any questions that um, the community or the council might have. Uh, thank you. That was awesome. Uh, Councillor McKenzie, do you have a question? Yeah, thank you very much for your presentation there. Uh, Despite knowing about yellow flag iris for years here, I, I did learn quite a bit out of this uh, report you sent out in our agenda here. A uh, couple questions I did have. Are there many opportunities in your experience for provincial or federal funding f to eradicate the yellow flag iris? Is one. Yes. Yeah. So provincial and federal funding. Um, you know, that's sort of a tricky one because... Um, so, okay, so the best opportunities to get provincial and federal funding are to show that there are multi-species impacts of an invasive plant. So I've been successful getting federal funding when I've been able to show that yellow flag iris is impacting a rare and endangered species in the area. And so it's kind of a backdoor approach, but for especially for federal funding, um, if you can demonstrate the, the larger impact of the yellow flag iris to very specific species, um, like the painted turtle is in Dutch Lake, so possibly there's, there's that connection that can be made. Thanks. Uh, further? Yeah, and just thank you for that. Uh, just one other question now with the bathtub effect we have down there, no in or out flows. Is this something the use of a fountain would have any positive effect on? Mm, in, terms of yellow, yeah. in terms of yellow flag iris, I don't no. see how that would impact it, but. Yeah, okay. Um, further questions? Uh, Councillor Bratton. Hi, thank you very much for your presentation. That was very insightful. I have a question about um, what is the deep water cutting process? Is it a machine based or human based or what is that? Yeah. So it's right now it is that, um, yeah, we use um, long handled shears. Oh, I see. So they're like um, grass shears and they're on maybe a meter and a half long arms. So you can walk into deep water and you can just get down to the bottom. So it's not a mechanical, I mean, it's mechanical, but it's not automated. It's still a human walking around cutting the plants. So these types of processes, if you have um, groups of people that got together to do this, is that type of thing um, allowable or, or do you need permits and things of that nature to follow through with these things? Yeah, we would still need permits, but Shoot, we lost her. 
Oh, oh, there she is. Oh, you're back now. Yeah. 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 So we still need permits because any work in and about water requires provincial permitting, but um, it doesn't require special tools or, you know, I mean, the tool is very simple. And are you aware of any um, impact to the painted turtle with the iris? Or is that something we have to research? Yes. So, well, the, there's somebody down in Vancouver who did a study that showed that the painted turtle is negatively affected by yellow flag iris. So it, um, the, it avoids yellow flag iris, basically. That might be a good thing. <laughs> Help us out. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Uh, further questions, uh, Councillor. Thank Rizzle? you. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Um, I yeah. did. You did say um, that you're um, on. You're doing ongoing treatments right now. What exactly is that that you're doing? So, yeah. So we're treating with the benthic barrier along the shoreline next to the public beach. Can I? So it's just at a public beach, so it's not anywhere else around the lake? Just in Not the yet. Okay. Yeah. We've been focusing on the property that's owned by the District of Clearwater so that it's easy, easy to work. I Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bratton again. Go ahead. Um, sorry. I have one more question. If a um, private landowner um, requested to have you put the barrier um, near their property, is that allowed to be tagged into this? Um, what do you mean by tagged into this? <laughs> Are you allowed to go to their property to help them put the barrier down? Yes. So um, what I have to do is anytime that I'm working on private property, I have to um, submit a section 11. So that's what I would do in, like I would work with the private landowner to submit a section 11 and get permission to treat the yellow flag iris um, on their property. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, a couple questions for me. Uh, you answered a few of them about the wildlife sensitivities. I mean, we we have a still have an environment, even if it's a, a invasive species environment. And what else are we affecting in the water? Sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Can you stop uh, screen sharing uh, if you wouldn't mind, Doctor Terzoff? I think it just causes mm -hmm. uh, a looping effect or something. Um, there we go. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then, um, so the jurisdiction and permitting, I know we've had, uh, maybe one or two cases of conflict with landowner. Um, I'm just trying to think of how effective this is going to be if we don't, what, what kind of critical mass of area do we need to sort of, uh, achieve on treatment before this starts to catch up and you know, turn the tide on this, so to speak. Right. It's hard to say how much area needs to be treated each year, but what I've been doing um, at Vaso Lake uh, for the past year now um, that I think is really effective is that um, we, treat, we treat the yellow flag iris with the benthic barrier and then any area that doesn't get treated with the barrier gets deadheaded so that way we're stopping that seed cycle and the seed production um treating you know the lake i think that we're looking at probably you know at least 15 years to make a significant impact um mostly it's that there needs to be large-scale treatments for five or six years to make a dent and to stop and and to do the deadheading um, to stop the seed production. Yeah, thank you. Um, that's kind of what I wanted to know. Um, and the last question for me is how long are the seeds viable? I mean, you say they float around mm -hmm. for about a year, but um, do they have a breakdown time before? Yeah. I, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking of knapweed, which seems that knapweed and mosquitoes, two things that seem to come back year and years, you know, multiple years after um, they, they the seed is created. Let's just put it that way. Um, mosquito seeds mm -hmm. aren't a real thing. But anyways, go ahead. Yeah, so the seed viability, that's a question that's come up quite a bit, and there's been no published articles on that that I found. So 
it's hard for me to say how long lived the seeds are, except for to say that, um, you know, that the person had this one paper where they had them floating for a year, um, which indicates the seed is still viable if it's floating. So, yeah, I can't say, you know, I really can't say how long the seeds are so viable for. Okay, then my follow-up question to that is how much seed does an average plant, you know, are we talking five seeds, 100 seeds per plant? Is there, yeah. is, mm -hmm. is it, is it the, like a pea pod? Like, so I know Napweed puts off, you know, that almost seems like thousands of seeds. What's the situation with the flag iris? Yeah, yellow flag iris. Um, so each stem, it's hard because it, it grows in big mats. So there's no individual plants they're all just connected to each other but um, each stem that comes up has probably five flowers and each flower has probably 50 seeds so um, yeah each stem is probably producing somewhere around 200 to 400 seeds so yeah each flower is probably producing 50 seeds okay thank you um, if there's no further questions, um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, there definitely is a lot of uh, landowner interest right now around the community in this, and hopefully we can get some traction and maybe look at some grants for this to help out uh, continue this work on because uh, people do definitely care about this in this community. So thank you for uh, your time and your presentation. Oh, thank sorry, you. Mr. Thomas would like to add something? I, I do. Recognizing that the district contributes about $2,500 annually to make a substantive dent or improvement in the delivery of this program, approximately what uh, value of investment will be required? Um, I would say that about, uh, you probably have to budget twenty-five dollars to $30,000 a year uh, for five years to make a significant dent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Excellent. Good uh, information to have. Thank you for your time. Um, My pleasure. Bye-bye. Okay, um, moving on to adoption of, oh, next page, item uh, 8.1. Uh, adoption of the minutes of the regular council meeting held March 21st, 2023. Uh, there is a recommendation. Moved by Councillor Fizzle. Second that. Second by Councillor McKenzie. All those in favor? And that passes because we all voted for it. Uh, nothing under item 9. Item 10. Uh, Mr. Krause is online. Uh, RZ2102 rezoning, 428 Sunshine Valley Road. Go ahead whenever you're ready, Mr. Krause. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Hopefully my screen share is working here. You are sharing and uh, yeah, we can see you and hear Perfect. you. Perfect. Perfect. So my planning poetry today is rezoning application RZ2102, uh, rezoning for property located at Sunshine Valley Road. The owner is requesting to rezone to CR1, country residential, in order to enable future subdivision. And the lot is about 17 hectares, about 42 acres in area. So the property is currently zoned RL1 rural, and that requires a 10 acre minimum lot size. And the owner is requesting country residential zoning, which would enable lots down to one acre in size if connected to municipal water. So the property is also designated country residential in the official community plan. So the proposed rezoning aligns with uh, the vision uh, and policy of the official community plan. Currently, the owner is proposing 10 lots as shown roughly here in this sketch. Um, and I should acknowledge that the property was actually rezoned in 2009 and the owner at that time uh, did not proceed with the development. And in 2016, when the district adopted its new zoning bylaw 133, there were a few properties like this one that were not developed um, and it was decided to Rather than having this vacant pre-zoned land, council did rezone a number of these properties back to rural so that in the future, when it was time for development, there could be a new public process uh, and a rezoning to let neighbors know and so on. So to not have pockets of pre-zoned land. The property is 
located within service level area two, which means that connection to the district's water system is required. There may be some limitations and potential offsite works that might need to be completed to enable the subdivision that would be handled at time of subdivision, but it's important to acknowledge that through the rezoning process. So the owner is agreeable to register a covenant on title, which would outline that there needs to be um, servicing requirements met prior to subdivision approval. Um, and that's basically to warn future owners if it changes hands that the that there may be additional limits to the number of lots that are possible here due to servicing or servicing limitations. So in other words, if the rezoning is approved, it would enable down to one acre size lots, but servicing limits may end up restricting it to even less than the 10, acre, 10 lots that the owner is currently proposing. And finally, I just wanted to mention as well that the district's trails master plan identifies two trails bordering the property, 6A and 6E, shown on the screen here. 6A is straightforward. Um, it follows Sunshine Valley Road within the existing right-of-way. Trail 6E would mean that the owner would have to dedicate land and potentially impact the number of lots, or at least the size of lots. Um, the official community plan policy is to accept cash in lieu of park. So if so, staff just want to bring this to council's attention uh, as we will be following OCP policy. But if council feels strongly that they want to acquire trail 6E, then we would need a separate specific resolution uh, from council to direct staff. So today we are recommending that the rezoning bylaw be read a first and second time and be authorized to a public hearing. This doesn't mean you're approving the application today. It would only be to authorize staff to go ahead and get this published uh, and notified to neighbors to set up a public hearing at a future meeting. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, does council have any questions at this time on this one? Um, thank you for the clarification on the Trail 6E. I'm noting on your uh, diagram, um, you're going to ask a question next. Okay. Uh, I, I am noting on your diagram that the trail at the, the north side of that property is already, does that already have a easement or a right of way or something on it on the, the 6C? Yeah. yeah, so this portion is already dedicated road. Okay. So it's dedicated road to this point. And then the new acquisition would be getting something along the property line here and something along the property line traveling down to Old North Thompson Highway. That would be the only way to acquire this full connection that's uh, generally envisioned in the in the master plan. Okay, thank you. I'm just uh, asking that because I'm sure that we're going to get it from the people doing trails. Mm -hmm. Further questions from council or anything? If not, oh, go ahead, uh, Council Frizzle. So just to clarify that um, road you're, or trail you're just talking about, mm -hmm. that it's going to be it's designated as a trail, not as a roadway. So it is, this road is already dedicated up to this point. Right there, okay. Yeah, up to this point. Um, beyond that, we would have to try, if council directed us to, to try to acquire that from the owner. If we did that, we'd be acquiring it as trail. I don't think you would want 20 meter wide uh, walkways. So it would probably be a narrower um, trail with that point. Because I don't think a road connection is envisioned through here. That's what I was wondering. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, further questions? What's that road name? <laughs> Do we have a road name to that? It's not. It's, I don't think it's, there's it's no name on that road or anything. It's it's just a designated area that could be turned into the road. We have a few of those. <laughs> so. Okay. So because I'm. Is blind, your mic on? Sorry. I think so. Okay. Am I on? Yes. Um, how about I pull it closer? That might be better. That road connects to. Sunshine Valley Road, the one that isn't really a road? <laughs> Correct. So this is Sunshine Valley Road, and yeah. this is Brookfield Road coming down, and this is a further extension that was taken, likely envisioning at some point. Remember, this would have been years ago before oh, okay. the district was incorporated. The Ministry of Transportation may have had a plan at one point to gotcha. have this road go all the way through and make a connection. Um, that might have been in the work, so that's why it was dedicated to this point. Um, but now the trails master plan envisions some sort of a connection along property line. 
so these people can walk or and uh, the the intention is to only ex like if they have to um, use just this fellow's property they're not taking any away from that other piece of property to make the trail it's all on if this proposal mm -hmm. So the only thing we could do as part of this process and part of the subdivision would be to take it from this property owner. Gotcha. We couldn't force a neighbor through this process. Right, right. Okay, just clearing that up. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Thank you for your report. If there's nothing else, thank you for your uh, time, uh, and Alex. And this will be later on in your agenda as well, Council. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, moving on to, there's nothing under item 11, moving on to 13, uh, the last couple of weeks have been fairly busy, uh, a lot of discussion on highways, safety and roads in the media, um, the new BC housing, um, session and, and announcements yesterday is going to, are going to be of great interest to the counselors that are down at the UBCM housing uh, seminar right now. Uh, we have three down there right now. Councilor Herring, Matheson and Sim are attending that. Um, on April 1st, I attended the Legion for their mortgage burning party. That was a great event. Um, they really like fire in there and they didn't burn down their buildings, which is great because now they own it. Um, on the 29th of March, I attended a BC Hydro net metering online seminar for three hours, which is basically BC Hydro's looking at how they pay um, power people that are generating power off their homes via solar or wind or micro hydro off of their properties, how they pay them for that power. Uh, so um, it, it, that was fascinating. You actually can, uh, in, in a roundabout way, sell your excess power to BC Hydro, um, and they are improving the rates on that. Um, on 29th also was agenda setting. On Thursday, the 23rd was probably uh, the most fun event of the last couple weeks. Uh, it was 4-H speech night. And the little, the, the, the very young kids, some of them were as young as six that were giving speeches, were amazing. Um, I think they should all run for council as soon as they become legal age because they're better speakers than most of us. Um, but yeah, that was super fun. And then in the middle of that, I had the cold for seven days. So um, TNRD meetings, uh, March 30th, and I will be away for the next council meeting. So there is a lot happening in the next month. So. Anyways, moving on to 14.1, Councillor Bratton. Hi, it's been fairly quiet for me uh, over the last couple weeks. Um, we were supposed to meet with the cemetery group, but we didn't have enough to meet a quorum. So we're rescheduling and hopefully we'll come up with a date for that. Also, May Day is coming up May. So if you have a float idea, get one together. <laughs> And we're getting a few registrants. I have a feeling people will be wanting to register on the day, and I do have some help for that. But I'm really hoping people pre-register since I made an online option. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, there have been a couple different versions of this route. What is the current version of the route? Where is it starting from? We are starting at... Uh, the we're start the actual route now is at Kershaw subdivision we are lining up along the side of the road um, which if you remember back in old days uh, they just lined up on the side of the road anyways down in the flats so we just took up the squares you know the blocks <laughs> Clearwater blocks that we have. Uh, so anyways, we're just in a long line. We might um, set up walkers through Kershaw. I will be contacting homeowners along there because there's a lot of uh, livestock, meaning horses and whatnot, and I don't want to um, cause any issues that way with homeowners um, because so far I think we have six emergency vehicles wanting to register at this point, and I know they all love their lights and sirens. So. Anyways, uh, we'll try and get them to wait till they get a little farther down. So from Kershaw, we will go along the old highway and stop at Super Save. We don't want to encompass the bridge uh, and try and as, as we were a little bit concerned about blocking um, backup of uh, traffic, you know, how far up the hill it would end up going. And I also need to request 37 East if we can block that off <laughs> what, for about an hour. <laughs> We'll pass that on to staff and, and thank you for that explanation of the route um, uh, that does leave an awful lot of corridor uh, both uh, Brookfield um, median 
um, the lawn there and lots of different places and I know there's some little technical things in there but I think I wanted to explain to people that uh, I think an earlier version had just been a long brook field looping around there and, and stopping there but this is actually oh adding, that was very um, preliminary hardware and things yeah. like that so, so so also to add to that we um, if you have a float or low bed or what have you you can take off up to camp two do a turnaround and if you need to or you can go around behind safety mart if you have to but we're hoping that most people will I mean, they can park wherever they want to watch, but you can use Safety Mart to park. Um, we're leave, hoping to leave 37 East for uh, float parking afterwards. And then, of course, there will be fun in the gym here. Uh, we'll have games set up and food and whatnot. So it's more of just a float idea or a parade idea and uh, hopefully an all-day event. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, moving on, Councillor Frizzle. I had a very quiet week and have nothing to report. Thank you. Councillor McKenzie. Yeah, thank you. Uh, pretty quiet couple weeks for myself as well, but uh, I will be going to Council of Forest Industries Conference in Prince George, April 12th to 14th. So on the 18th meeting, I'll definitely have more to report in regards to that. And I just want to congratulate the U18 Ice Sox uh, for their provincial win recently. You know, this Valley's always raised a lot of good talent, and it's about time. Nice to finally see a provincial banner hanging from the rafters. So well job well job well done to uh coaches players everyone involved and all the uh helpers there as well over the course of that week excellent volunteer effort and correct me if i'm wrong the the women's girls hockey team came in third in provincials bronze so bronze medal as well so congratulations to them as well uh, moving on to CAO report, uh, you have in your package the uh, Q1 newsletter, if you have any, yeah, looks good, lots in there. Um, any further comments on any of that, Mr. Thomas? Nope. Good. Nope. Uh, we're, we are certainly looking for a new executive assistant and uh, trying to roll out a community call out for future newsletters for groups and stuff who may want to advertise specific programs in here. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, no, it looks really good. And uh, the updated meeting schedule is in there as well as a fight of 15.2. Uh, new business, uh, community chair rotation extension. There is a recommendation and um, staff, if you wish to speak to this or if uh, council has questions of staff on this. We'll, we'll start with uh, Mr. Prime. Go ahead, if you'd like to just say where this comes from. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yes, so this came from a re uh, request from council at the last meeting, uh, just uh, highlighting that six-month terms were not necessarily effective in sort of continuity of leadership. Uh, so I rescheduled the uh, terms, and uh, they're before you. Um, I would like to fill in any tbds if anyone had noted a spot that they would like to fill keeping in mind that working groups can have up to three council members on the working group um, at your discretion thank you um there's a recommendation here um but um if you wouldn't want to think about the tbds the to be determines on there and uh, submit your name or uh, approach uh, mr prime and to pencil it in we can do that at a later council meeting um and I do appreciate this because, um, especially with the way the, the year rotates, it's really hard necessarily to get enough time in the seat of any of these committees because sometimes things just don't happen for months at a time. Um, so the annual schedule is actually kind of nice. Councillor like Bratton. Do you have to, do you have to um, submit at a council meeting to say you want to be on one? Uh, oh, just, just let staff know and, and then we'll bring that forward. Um, at this particular point, heads and volunteers are more than welcome on a lot of these positions. So, okay. Uh, so there is a recommendation. What is the will of council on the recommendation? Uh, the council approves the appointments of the committee of the district Clearwater standing select external and working groups with modifications to terms effective November 1st to October 31st and November 1st to 2023. Uh, to October 31st, 2024. And of course, uh, as always, we could amend this in the future if things need to change. 
Yeah, I'd like to move the recommendation, please. Thank you, Councillor McKenzie. Seconded by Councillor Bratton. All those in favor, and that passes. Thank you. Um, item 16.2, this is uh, somewhat exciting. New provincial legislation requiring us to do some of this, but uh, there's establishing an accessibility committee under the Accessible British Columbia Act. Uh, there is a staff report and comments from Mr. Thomas. I'd like to invite uh, Deputy Corporate Officer Prime to speak to the report. Yes, so this legislation did come into effect um, back in September of 2022, regulating uh, local governments and other uh, public corporations. Um, so the deadline for us to have this in effect is September 1st, 2023. So we do have a bit of time, but it's best to be ahead of the ball on this and not behind. Um, we did sort of uh, review here whether a working group would be effective or if it's a standing committee. And I think the closest to the intended legislation is a standing committee was what we determined ultimately. Um, and that would just provide the most direct avenue to council to make recommendations. Um, beyond that, um, we're really just looking for uh, to strike the committee and then we would come back with the terms of reference at the next council meeting uh, for council to discuss then. Thank you. Are there questions of staff on this? Uh, Mr. Thomas, would you like to speak and add? Go ahead. Uh, in addition to Deputy Corporate Officer Prime, we have attached a couple of resources here for council to be aware of, including um, the implementation timeline from the province for the Accessibility BC Act, as well as the 2016 report that was done titled Front Door to Grocery Store, Getting Seniors Where They Want to Be in Clearwater, the final report on page, um, one sec here, on page 102 of the package or page 10 of the report, we have a list of um, initiatives and, and priorities that were either completed were forecasted to be short-term recommendations, medium-term recommendations, and long-term recommendations, ending on page uh, 105 of the package or page 13 of the report. And it would be uh, best practice to have those initiatives reviewed as part of the accessibility project for the District of Clearwater in developing a future plan. Uh, further questions, comments from council? Um, I'll, st I'll start off. Um, yeah, I think it's good. The uh, front door, door to grocery store um, study actually was kind of very interesting because it was an academic study when it started uh, by UNBC um, with a goal of sort of understanding the problems in a small town for accessibility for people. Um, what started to happen sort of organically in the middle of it is that as people that were aware of the study or watching it happen around them, say PharmaSave or some of the other stores in town, actually started to make changes to how they operated based on what the study was identifying. So clearing their alley aisles of excessive displays and that sort of thing so people could access them, um, curbs that were tripping people up, um, bus stop, thing, things to do with buses and locations and drop-offs. Um, so it almost in a way sort of skewed the result of the study because, you know, you're trying to establish a baseline and you're making changes as you go along. Um, it, it was excellent work, um, uh, but it is 10 years old and I think it's great that we're going to be looking for a broad community committee um, to look at this because every person's perspective is important on this one. Uh, further comments or questions? Uh, Councillor Frizzle. I just wanted to make note of the front door to grocery store. That was a three-year study, and um, they actually took seniors out on the bus, and they brought simple changes like walking into the medical center and hitting their heads on the, the flower bit pots that were too low. So simple things that nobody thought of. That, the medical center did not have an automatic door when that started it does now and, and it's those simple things the reason that the bylaw is the way it is is because of that study so um it, i i really think we need to go back and look at it and because i think we've done a lot i think we can do a lot more and i think it this is just a great idea and i love it thank you 
Uh, excellent points. Uh, so there are a pair of recommendations. Do these need to be moved separately or together? At council's decision. Okay, so we can move these together if uh, council wishes to do so. Um, two point recommendations here that council strike a standing committee and then that council direct staff to develop a terms of reference um, to be presented. Thank you, uh, Councilor Frizzo moved. Do you have a question or second it? Seconded by Council Bratton. Uh, okay, uh, further discussion? This is good, it's very interesting. All those in favor? And that passes, thank you. Um, item 16.3, UBCM CEPF EOC grant application. Um, and I'm sure staff can tell us what this is about. Thank you. Deputy Corporate Officer Prem and perhaps uh, Fire Chief Smith as well. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so we were approached uh, l pretty late in the game for this uh, grant application. Uh, we were approached by SIMP to do a regional uh, exercise on this. Um, you know, we were aware of the grant initially, but had sort of passed on it due to just staff capacity at the time to develop an exercise in grant application. Uh, however, SIMP sort of uh, came to us and said, hey, we have this regional exercise we'd like to do. We'd like to share the costs. It's going to include all the municipalities, Barrier, TNRD, um, and we'd like you on board. They provided us with a lot of the um, sort of initial information to get the grant application done. So it has been uh, submitted um, and just pending that we would have the resolution passed and submitted to them. Otherwise, we would withdraw it um, if uh, council so choose to not pass the resolu resolution at this time. Thank you. Uh, further comments from anybody else? No? Uh, questions from council on this one. Uh, so basically the, the horse is out of the barn, but we want to ride the horse and keep going down the road on this one. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, yeah, anyways. Um, no, but I think this is incredibly important. Um, uh, multiple people in this room, including various councillors, have sat on various versions of these exercises. Every time you do it, you find another thing in the plan. I don't want to call them faults or gaps, but sometimes they are, um, that you need to pay attention to. It's, it's always a good learning experience. So um, I'm fully in support of this, especially when we're talking about uh, partnership with uh, all the various organizations. If you are unaware, SIP First Nation actually has a mobile EOC trailer, which is sort of a, a masterful example of how to do this right. Um, it's a resource that, that potentially with good partnership could be utilized by us if we were to ever be in an incident and it has been offered in the past. So um, what is the desire of council on this one? Thank you. Moved by Councillor Frizzle, seconded by Councillor McKenzie. All those in favor? Thank you. And that passes. Moving on to page four of your agenda. Uh, zoning Amendment 17.1 RZ21-02. Uh, amendment bylaw number 280-2023. There are two recommendations there. Uh, move the first one by Councillor Frizzle, seconded by... I'll second it. Thank you, Councillor McKenzie. Uh, District of Clearwater, uh, bylaw number 280-2023, a bylaw to amend District of Clearwater Zoning Bylaw number 133, whereas application RZ21-02 for amendment to Zoning Bylaw 133 has been made, and whereas the desirable changes and uses of land have been considered, and whereas the zoning amendment conforms to the District of Clearwater Official Community Plan, now therefore, Council of the District of Clearwater in an open meeting assembles and acts as follows. This bylaw might be cited as District of Clearwater bylaw, zoning bylaw 133, amendment bylaw number 280-2023. All those in favor? Okay. And then item second recommendation? I'll move that. Thank you, Councillor McKenzie, seconded by Councillor uh, Frizzle. And this is to take this, uh, to read this for a second time so that it can be taken to public hearing for public input. Uh, District of Clearwater bylaw number 280-2023, a bylaw to amend District of Clearwater zoning bylaw number 133, whereas an application, 
number RZ21-02 for amendment to zoning bylaw number 133 has been made and whereas the desirable changes and uses of land have been considered and whereas the zoning amendment conforms to the District of Clearwater official community plan now therefore the Council of the District of Clearwater in open meeting assembles and acts as follows this bylaw may be cited as District of Clearwater bylaw number 133 amendment bylaw number 280-2023 all those in favor and that one passes as well. Thank you. Um, there are no committee of the whole correspondence. Oh, did I? Sorry, I did. Financial plan. Oh, God, the account stuff. I'm in so much trouble. Anyways, uh, item 17.2, there is a recommendation. Uh, does staff wish to speak to this one before we get to there? Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Mayor uh, Blackwell. Uh, so now we are in our final steps of the financial plan process. We're going to go through the financial plan bylaw and the property tax bylaw will be coming forward to council next uh, council meeting. In the financial plan that you have in front of you, we've made a few changes from as council directed last meeting. The siphon, uh, we're going to do $100,000 of siphon pre-engineering work to a class B proposal. And we changed the scope of the accessibility study to rename it and calling it engineering and infrastructure studies. So there's, it's a broader scope and it's not directly for um, accessibility. It can include other items as well. And lastly, I've provided an updated format of the bylaw. And essentially what it's, what I've done is I've, put everything into the bylaw that is required by the legislation. And I've looked, we've done a little bit of research and it's quite a common format as other municipalities. What essentially it does is it removes Schedule C, which is all the detail about which projects um, that we're, we're, uh, we're doing during the year. And the reason um, that could be, not, it just creates more, it could create more work in bringing an amended but financial plan to council. Mr. Thomas. I'd like to uh, firstly acknowledge the amount of work Linda has put into this thing. Thank God she's here, or thank goodness she's here. We can't use religious symbols in council chamber. Um, that aside, this is going to be an iterative process as council refines the budget process with Questica and other mechanisms coming on the pipe. The budget bylaw and documentation surrounding it is going to evolve as well. In the future, we do hope to have a fleshed out budget narrative with the bylaw to, to explain to the public where the funds are being allocated to and for what priorities. Um, another important thing that we started discussion in the last term of council was about procurement. And th the, the concept is pretty simple. If we identify in granular detail every, um, where every dollar is going to be spent on every project, it actually impacts negatively the organization's capacity to get a robust procurement process that is neutral, if you will. If if I, as a contractor, know you're going to spend $10 in X and I'm bidding on X, I'm probably going to come close to bidding $10 or closer or above. So it helps in that way as well. Back to Linda. Thank you, CAO Thomas. Um, I just wanted to make one more uh, comment about regardless of the format that council chooses, staff will bring forward any changes in scope and any changes in budget of each of the projects that we have. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the explanation of the new format. That makes absolute sense. Um, and uh, yes, I love. I look look forward to the evolution of of budgeting, especially. Um, there's a lot of growing pains at the other organization that I sit on a regular basis for budgeting right now, um, and it's nice to see us significantly ahead in process on how they have to operate there, um, with acknowledging that they the TNRD I'm speaking about has considerably more complex 
books than ours. Um, but we're definitely headed in the right direction. I really love this. I understand what's going on. Um, um, so uh, with that, there is a recommendation, unless council has further questions or comments at this point. Um, thank you. Uh, there is a recommendation that council give the first three readings of the district law or bylaw number 281-2023. Uh, oh, sorry, Mr. Thomas, go ahead. Which format would it be? Format? Uh, oh, the, the new, new format. format. The new format. Well, Thank the bylaw, I, I believe the bylaw looks exactly this. There's no difference other than the fact that. Yes, yeah. so my citation or my reading of the citation is going to be exactly the same regardless of either one. But yes, the new format is good. We like that. Hand, being handcuffed by things that we put in writing and having to amend later is uh, unnecessary work. So. Thank you. Uh, moved by Councillor Fizzle, seconded Second that. by Councillor McKenzie. This is to read it for. Do I need to actually read it three times? I do. Okay. Okay. So District of Clearwater. So this is actually going to be three separate motions. Um, we're going to have to do this three times. Yeah. Okay, so um, is it the desire of the person that moved this to read all three together? Okay. Yes, you can. We always used that you to read the first one, and then we could combine the second and third. Is you is, could do is that. it still okay I, doing all three at once? I, I, I think uh, move it for the first time, yeah. and let's do second and third because I think to be clear, I think that's my understanding of how it's supposed to go. So, move it for the to be read for the first time. I, I move to read it for the first time. And second. you're okay with that? Thank you, Councilor McKenzie. <laughs> District of Clearwater, 2023 to 2027, five-year financial plan, bylaw number 281-2023, a bylaw to adopt the 23, 2023 to 2027 financial uh, five-year financial plan, whereas section 165 of the community charter requires that the council shall adopt a five-year financial plan and now therefore the council of the district of clearwater in open meeting assembled and acts as follows this bylaw may be cited as district of clearwater bylaw number 281 2023 the 2023 to 2027 five-year financial plan all those in favor somebody wish to move two and three together thank you uh seconder on that I'll second it. thank you councillor mckenzie everybody gets their name on the agenda today because there's only four of us here district of clearwater 2023 to 2027 five-year financial plan bylaw number 281 2023 uh, bylaw to adopt the 2023 to 2027 five-year financial plan whereas section 165 of the community charter requires the council shall adopt a five-year financial plan now therefore the council of the district of clearwater in an open meeting assembles and acts as follows this bylaw may be cited as district of clearwater bylaw number 281 2023 2023 to 2027 five-year financial plan all those in favor thank you and that passes so next meeting we go to adoption on that. Thank you. Um, uh, but I'm not here, so y'all can decide what we're doing. Um, thank you. Uh, there is no committee of the whole. Uh, correspondence required. Correspondence information only. Notices of motion. Uh, comments from the public. Is there any in person or online? Okay, thank you. Uh, we do have require to go into an in-camera. Uh, there is a recommendation that meeting be closed to the public pursuant to sections I of the receipt of advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege, including the communications necessary for that purpose and L discussions with municipal officers and employees respecting the municipal objectives, measures and progress reports uh, for the purpose of preparing an annual report under section 98 of the community charter. Uh, can I get a mover and a seconder on that? Moved by Councillor Frizzle, seconded by Councillor Bratton. All those in favor? And that passes. And we will take a 10-minute recess till 3.20 and then come back for in-camera. Thank you. <laughs>